Well, hello everyone and welcome to my channel. So my name's James and I've got 12 years experience teaching electrical circuits to undergraduate students in a UK university. So I bet you're here because you've signed up to an electrical engineering degree and you're finding it difficult. That doesn't surprise me at all. And a key reason for that is really expectation management. So you probably started your degree and you thought in a few weeks, mom, she'll be designing things like you see on the screen. Sophisticated circuits, advanced robotics, military technology. But actually, the reality is not like that. It's more like this. It's boring, it's complicated, and it looks like it's useless. How could that complicated looking circuit ever be of any use to anything in the real world? So during my time teaching this kind of material to undergraduate students, I've learned what makes students tick. I know what they find difficult. I know what they find easy. So this series of videos is really going to distill down to the fundamental concepts of electrical circuits and focus on giving you the tools you need to be able to analyze and understand electrical circuits. So let's get into it. So over the past 12 years, I've taught at least 1,000 students electrical circuits at a UK university. And without doubt, all students coming in to study this subject struggle with the four main points listed on this slide. Firstly, it's that the concepts I'm teaching are all very simple, but when you put them all together to solve a complicated circuit, it can become confusing. There's lots of algebra and it's very easy to make a mistake. And the way to avoid this really is to practice. Practice hundreds of problems until it becomes very fluent to you so you don't make those simple mistakes. Secondly, there's often many ways to solve a problem. So given a circuit like we saw on the previous slide, there's many ways you could solve this. But one way may need one or two lines of equations to solve it. And another way might need two or three pages of equations to solve that circuit. And I should say here, by solve a circuit, I mean find a parameter that's not actually shown on the circuit diagram. So it might be calculating the current for a resistor or the voltage across a component. Thirdly, a lot of students start studying this topic and think they know the basics already. A lot of the material we'll cover in some of the early videos is what might be considered high school um, information, things like Ohm's law. Most people watching this video will already know what Ohm's law is, but actually it's the minutiae of the subject that people don't fully appreciate. Yeah, everybody knows what Ohm's law is, but actually there's some concepts that most people are unfamiliar with. They're very basic concepts, but as we move further into the course and get to more advanced material, we're really relying on this fundamental knowledge to be able to make progress. So if you just skip several videos, just go straight to the one you're most interested in, you're probably going to miss out on something fundamental, which you need to make everything make sense. So don't be tempted to skip videos because you've seen the material before. And the final point is really a lot of students never read around the subject. They rely on the lecturer that delivers the material or they rely on a single textbook or one single video series. Don't do that. Materials presented in different ways by different people and you may prefer one person over another. So I encourage you to look around, use YouTube, use these videos, find different textbooks and really try and find lots of different ways the same material is presented in different ways to help you understand it. Well, that's enough introduction from me. Let's start with some actual content. And this is going to be really basic in this first introductory video. And we're going to be talking about concepts of current and voltage. So first off, what on earth is electricity? Well, electricity is the phenomena resulting from the presence and flow of electric charge. So here we've got a really simple picture of an atom. We can see in the middle of it, we've got a nucleus which contains protons positively charged and neutrons which have got no charge. And surrounding that or orbiting it are the electrons. And in this series of videos, we're primarily interested in the electrons. 
okay? So electrons are negatively charged particles, and they have a charge of minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So that's a very small number, 10 to the minus 19, but we're also dealing with very big numbers of electrons, so there's a lot of them. So what encourages some electrons to move away from the nucleus? Well, again, if we take our simple picture of an electron and we look at its outer shell, so the valence shell, we can see in some atoms we'll have a valence electron. And if we want that electron to move away from the atom, we need to move it into what we call the conduction band. So here we've got an energy level diagram and in this material labeled number one, we're in our valence band here, and we've got a massive jump in energy to take that electron from here right up to here. So we have to provide an enormous amount of energy to do that. And that type of material would actually be what we'd consider an insulator. What this little video clip shows though is that there's actually no such thing as a perfect insulator. Everything becomes a conductor if you apply enough voltage. In a semiconductor, we can see that this forbidden band or the gap between the valence band and the conduction band is very is smaller, so we don't need to apply as much energy to make an electron jump from there to there. Finally, in the case of a metal, number three, the conduction band and the valence band are basically the same thing. There is no forbidden band or gap between the two, so we don't have to apply any energy to make electrons move around away from their atoms. And if we could sort of see the electrons and atoms in a, in a piece of metal, what we'd actually see is lots of these valence electrons moving around. The key point here, though, and the, the, the fact that we've got these arrows pointing in all different directions tells us something. It basically tells us that electrons are moving all the time in a piece of metal, but they're moving in a random direction, so the net movement basically is zero. They're not moving more in one direction than they are in another. So there's net flow of electrons in just a piece of metal. However, if we apply an electric field, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, then those electrons are going to be attracted to it. Okay, electrons we said had a negative charge, so if we place a positive charge here, they'll be attracted towards it. On the previous slide, we just saw that in a piece of metal, the electrons are all moving around in random directions. If we want them all to move in one direction, then we need to apply a potential difference. And if you look at lots of online courses or textbooks, etc., to explain potential difference, almost exclusively an, an analogy is used using a water pump and water flowing around a circuit. I don't particularly like that analogy. Let's have a look at a different way of thinking about it. Let's forget electrons for a moment and let's think about people in an elevator. So a person gets in the elevator on the ground floor, some work is done against gravity to lift those people to a higher level. And what we can say about those people is that they've gained in potential energy. Their potential energy has increased. And that's basically a function of their mass times gravity times height. So as they're lifted up, potential energy increases. And obviously here we've got a little diagram of some different buildings in London. The potential energy of somebody stood on the top of um, Big Ben is nowhere near as high as it would be as somebody stood on top of a shard. But obviously more work needs to be done from to lift somebody from the ground here up there than it is from here to there. So we can say that they have higher potential energy and we've had to do more work. Of course, once you're at the top of one of these buildings or you know, you've gained that potential energy, you're then free to convert that potential energy into something, another form of energy, for example, kinetic energy, like going around this slide. So there you've turned potential energy into kinetic energy by going down a water slide, for example. And that's no different to an energy source in a circuit. So here we can view this little energy source as almost like an elevator. It lifts electrons up to a higher potential, and then they're free to go through a wire in this case back down to this lower point of potential, and in doing so, they're doing some work. If this was just a piece of wire, that wire would be getting hot, and this battery is doing work, and then work is being expended here. 
So it's absolutely vital that you understand that potential differences of voltages are measured between two points in a circuit. So if we take this battery for an example here, we have a low potential point here and a high potential point there. As voltages are measured in volts, we might say that this point here is 1.5 volts higher than this point here. What's fundamental though is if we just point here and say it's 1.5 volts, that's a meaningless statement without specifying that we're talking about between these two points. We're going to have a whole video on different types of energy sources relatively soon. But first, let's just look at these different types of energy sources. And we can all see they have different potential differences or different voltages. So this is a pylon in the UK, supergrid, 400,000 volts, an enormous potential difference. Whereas here, this is a wall socket in the UK. And between these two points here, you'd expect 240 volts, although that's an AC source. So that's going to be described in a lot more detail later on. If we look at this device here, this is a car battery. And the potential between this point and this point here is 12 volts. That's a higher potential than this battery, which has 9 volt potential difference between these two points. And of course, this is our single AA battery which has got a potential difference of 1.5 volts between those two points. So basically, the summary of this slide is that a potential difference makes electrons move around a circuit. The actual definition of one volt is when one joule of work is done. So one joule of work to lift one coulomb of electrons from one point to another. So if this battery does uses one joule to move one coulomb, which we'll define in a moment, from here to here, then we can say it's a one volt battery. Well, if we go back to our piece of metal now and we, we apply this potential difference, so this might be a connecting a piece of wire between two terminals on a battery. So negatively charged particles are going to be attracted to the positive terminal on that energy source. So we can see in this diagram that these little blue electrons are flowing from the negative terminal towards the positive terminal. That's actually the opposite to what we say current flows in an electrical circuit. And I'll explain why that is on the next slide. But for now, we just need to know that electrons are flowing around a wire and they're flowing from the more negative terminal on a battery to a more positive terminal on a battery. So if on average, um, electrons move more in one direction than another, as that diagram shows, the movement gives rise to what we call a current. Currents are measured in amperes, and one amp is a flow of one coulomb per second. So what on earth is a coulomb? Well, a coulomb is a measure of charge, and it is equivalent to 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons. So if we imagine our wire, and we have an observation point cut through the wire like a surface, and we're counting how many electrons pass that in a given time, then we will say one coulomb's worth of electrons will have passed, once we've counted, 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons. That's an awful lot of electrons. And there's an equation for this. So Q, which is our charge measured in coulombs, is equal to I, our current measured in amps, times the time of our observation, measured in seconds, of course. So if we have one amp in one second, we'll have one coulomb of charge past the observation point. If we have 10 coulombs of charge and we know our time is 10 seconds, we'll have one amp. If we measure a time varying current with an ammeter, well, actually, an ammeter is not quite the case, more likely an oscilloscope if we're talking about a time varying current. Ammeters typically tend to be used with DC circuits. But if we did that and we plot the currents versus time, we can actually calculate the charge pass through our wire. Um, by calculating the area under the curve. So if we look at a simple DC case where the current doesn't change with time at all, and we have two times T1 and T2, then if we calculate the area of that square, so it's going to be 1 times 1, we're going to get 1 amp times 1 second, which equals 1 coulomb. Very easy. Now, now if we have the case of a time varying current where we're going from 0 amps at 1 second to 1 amp at 2 seconds, we simply calculate the area by doing a half base times height. So that's the area of a triangle. And we can see we're going to do 1 times 1 
times 0.5, which is going to give us 0.5 coulombs of charge transferred in that time. So there's two important notes here. The first one is that we use small letters or lowercase letters to denote time varying values. And we use capital letters to denote time independent or DC values. The final point I'm going to talk about today is really about why we always say current flows from a more positive terminal of an energy source to a more negative terminal. Because that's the opposite way in which electrons are flowing around the circuit. So if we have a voltage source here, and this is our negative terminal, actually electrons are following the green path. They're flowing around this, this wire, this black wire, in an anti-clockwise direction, whereas we say current always flows in the direction that the red line is showing. So from the positive to the negative terminal. Why is that? It seems kind of crazy. And that's basically because we're not always going to be talking about electrons flowing around wires, okay? People sometimes are interested in semiconductors where both electrons and positively charged holes can conduct currents, or electrolytes where we have positively charged ions and negatively charged ions. So we need a convention so the type of charge carrier can be ignored. So in this series of videos, we're always talking about electrons. They're always negatively charged, so they're always going to flow towards the positive terminal of an energy source. We're always going to say that conventional current flows from the positive terminal of a voltage source to the more negative terminal. That's it for today's introductory video. I've just covered some very basic concepts and in future videos we're going to be looking more in details about how we can actually solve circuits and the techniques we need to do that. But just to summarize what we've learned today, we saw that the potential difference of voltage must be measured between two points and it's measured in volts. Current measured in amps is the flow of electrons around a circuit. So when we're talking about currents, we're thinking about particles moving through wires and the flow of those particles and how many of them are flowing. We saw that one amp is a flow of one coulomb per second. So I equals Q over T, where Q is the charge measured in coulombs. T is obviously time and I is our current measured in amps. And finally, we said that conventional current always flows from the more positive side of an energy source to a more negative side of an energy source. So thanks for listening and check back for the next video where we're going to be talking about simple circuits and Ohm's law.